Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the August Talk Talk. This evening, we have Martina Pacifici with a topic very hot those days, building physics processes governing traditional and modern houses. Please know that after the talk, we have a session of questions and answers. So please type your questions on the message bar at the bottom of the screen. Or after the talk, you can unmute your microphone and ask her directly your questions. Now I would like to hand over to Mark Wilson-Jones, our chair, to introduce Martina and her work to you. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Right, I just wanted to say uh, just a couple of words of general context because um, uh, Martina represents a kind of direction for Tag Talks that I'm really keen on. Um, being an academic uh, myself, uh, most of my life anyway, um, I'm really interested in having a good scientific, technical, um, evidence-based and analytical approach to, um, let's say, justifying what we do. And because sustainability and everything to do with energy and carbon is so important now for um, architectural practice in, generally, in general, and also because it's actually one of the cards in the hands of traditionalists in the sense that we have some natural arguments for sustainability. So, um, so there's these two really kind of uh, important uh, aspects of potential tag talks that come together in what Martina's going to talk about. So we have the sort of academic research basis um, for um, giving talks and, you know, from a very informed position, and there's the whole sustainability thing. And we had before Robin Pender, I think for those of you who were who saw that, that was that was really great. And Robin, by the way, Martina, I don't know if you saw it, but Robin Pender, she did this kind of wonderful overview, particularly sort of historic, or starting in the Middle Ages, looking at how building details uh, affected thermal um, performance and vice versa, and how everything from <clears throat> certain laws and taxes came in, you would get different building forms. And that was a sort of uh, a very great overview, but maybe isn't so helpful for those of us who are practicing today and need to get our buildings through building regulations and and all of that. So um, Martina's got this expertise that we're, you know, we'd really love you to hear about. And just briefly on her CV, the um, highlights are um, degree in architectural engineering from the um, Sapienza, that's um, university. I've also taught there, by the way, uh, just for one year, <laughs> Sapienza in Rome. And um, and then there was the uh, master's, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Martina, this is from memory in um, San Paolo. And then uh, a PhD, yeah. Oh, yeah, PhD. Sorry. <laughs> and then uh, I say then there's a raft of publications, which is say what I've referred to that they're proper publications and not just you know bits and pieces in BD or whatever. And mm -hmm. then um, there's uh, let's just mention we, you you were with AHMM for a couple of years, weren't you? And now you're with Adam Architecture. So I think um, we don't generally do huge long introductions, Martina. So I hope that's enough. And then uh, very much look forward. I'll go on to mute and very much look forward to hearing what you've got to tell us. Okay, thank you. No, it was a very generous introduction. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mark. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation uh, and for the opportunity to spend together this uh, um, afternoon, this late afternoon. Uh, the intent of the of the talk is uh, about. Uh, building physics knowledge sharing. Uh, there are some technical contents in the slide, but I will try to make this uh, a, as lighter as possible, let's say. And uh, yeah, I will say, let's start. So uh, Simon, if you could share your screen with the presentation, please. Okay, perfect. So the title is oh yeah uh, is building physics processes governing traditional and modern uh, houses. Next, the talk uh, um, includes some picture and uh, drawing, which will give you a taste uh, about what our sustainability 
team is working uh, with at the moment at Hadam Architecture. Our practice, uh, I know uh, many of you are familiar with, uh, but is a leader uh, in um, traditional and classical architecture and urbanism. And since one uh, year, uh, we have uh, uh, created a sustainability team in house to put sustainability at the you know, at the core of our project design and uh, delivery. The team is formed by engineers and architects uh, full-time dedicated to support the architectural teams. Next, please. Very briefly about the contents. Uh, so uh, we are starting uh, we are going to start with an overview on the uh, historic building uh, stock uh, in UK in the context of the climate emergency. Then the, the focus of the presentation is going to be traditional versus modern building uh, systems and finalizing with uh, uh, some retrofit uh, thoughts. Next, please. Next. Okay, so uh, to start, I would like to focus uh, uh, for a moment on what is happening in the world. Let's say that every one of us is less or more familiar with world like climate change, climate emergency, global warming. But sometimes I wonder if we are really uh, understanding as, as a society uh, the reach, the danger, and also the imminency of these uh, changes. And uh, especially in UK, we tend to see the raise of temperature as a kind of appealing scenario, no? sometimes, especially if you think in summer. Uh, however, the temperature increase is just one of the effects of the climate change and is linked to phenomena at a wider scale, such as, for example, the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream is... Uh, um, a small component of a much uh, larger uh, global water system and is one of the most important ocean currents. It originates in the Gulf of Mexico and then carry the warm ocean water northwards toward the pole where it cool and sink because of the um, increased salinity and increased density. And this process drives the ocean currents and is vital to redistribute the energy to whole uh, part of the globe. Now, scientists start to be concerned. We, we still don't have an agreed position, but uh, it seems that the stream could collapse by even early, like by 2025. Uh, due to the, of course, the raise of the greenhouse gas emission. And this could cause like uh, storms, uh, drop of temperature and rising of sea levels. Uh, so this global forecast su should suggest us that we are all involved, uh, all responsible, and uh, we can all do something. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think this this premise premise was important to remind us. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, about uh, um, our motivation and why building performance is so important nowadays to improve to be improved, and why carbon emission should be cut down. Uh, building wise, um, UK boasts a great record, being the faster country in Europe losing heat when compared to other uh, Europe uh, neighbors. Uh, of course, this is not a great news for us, and uh, this is some uh, number based on a recent study developed on a sample of 80,000 European homes, which as calculate uh, home temperature losses after five hours for a home that is at 20 degrees exposed at uh, zero degree outside. So because uh, the UK homes are, according to this study, uh, losing heat so fast, for example, um, three times faster than Germany, that has uh, one degree of heat loss, um, so uh, the heating, our heating system need to work harder to keep the indoor temperature constant. Next. Uh, but why this is happening? Mm, so uh, I would say there are many reasons, but the UK has certainly one of the oldest 
oldest housing stock in comparison to other Europe member states, with about 38% of the home um, dating back uh, to 1946, um, compared, for example, to Germany and Sweden that have 24%. So this uh, existing stock is old and is not performing very well unless uh, retrofit intervention are applied. Here in this chart, you are looking at uh, the total number of uh, UK dwellings broken down uh, by the, um, the space heating uh, demand. So the red group are the existing energy hungry homes and the green group is the homes which have been retrofitted. So as you may see, a transition is still required for many dwellings uh, to move from the existing level of high energy um, uh, demand to a better uh, standard like LETI or passive house target. Next uh, slide, please. And this transition uh, will be not only beneficial for uh, our bills, but uh, uh, also in terms of carbon emission, because buildings, uh, as you certainly know, are responsible for the 18% 80, uh, of the UK green gas uh, emission, uh, mainly due to their use of oil and gas for heating and hot water. And these emissions need to be cut down significantly in order to meet the UK uh, climate goals we have, we have committed to. Next, please. Um, but uh, how exactly uh, carbon emissions are related to rates of temperature? Let me explain this in simple terms. So more carbon is in the atmosphere more uh, masses of warm air are trapped in the lower uh, layers of the atmosphere and are not able to escape what in science we call uh, urban climate canopy. And uh, in this chart, you can uh, observe the liner, um, uh, the liner relationship linking the uh, global surface temperature increase and the CO2 equivalent. The chart show uh, uh, actually on the left hand side, the beginning of the global uh, warming due to the industrialization from uh, roughly 1850. And then on the right side hand, there is uh, um, actually the uh, very likely range of global surface temperature projection for five different uh, policy scenario with uh, the thick uh, mm, uh, colored uh, central line, which is representing the median of uh, uh, this emission. Uh, the policies, in fact, like, for example, building regulation and the target that we set play a huge uh, role in uh, determining uh, the pattern of uh, a country emission rate and consequently um, they affect our capacity to, um, to increase or mitigate global warming. Next slide, please. Uh, building wise, uh, our existing building stock uh, is our bigger problem um, and uh, Let's consider that the 80% of the homes that will exist in 2050 have already been built, which is actually this white arrow in the center of the chart. Uh, furthermore, uh, the new build standards are still not in line with net zero. Um, so this means that even the homes that we are building today are going to be retrofitted before 2050. So in few words, retrofit is a critical uh, in supporting this transition to net zero. And uh, we cannot reach any of these uh, targets and uh, ambitions if existing dwellings are not on board. Next slide, please. Next. Um, so, 
And these retrofits need to be delivered in a way that we achieve high standard of energy performance. I think the first barrier in doing that um, is the lack of understanding of how buildings work and perform from an environmental point of view. For this reason now, the second part of the presentation is going to focus uh, in, on uh, the main building physics phenomenon governing uh, the uh, traditional and modern homes. Uh, as traditional, we are referring uh, to properties um, as so more built before 1920. And uh, uh, for modern, it's everything is post this date. The age is a very important indicator of the energy performance of a building. Uh, different age, in fact, mean different construction techniques, different material uh, available at the time, different building uh, forms, and different architectural typologies, like, for example, different wall types. So the current uh, energy performance of a property is a reflection of its age and the specific energy and the economical and technical resources available at that time. Um, therefore, building uh, physics processes in old house are substantially different from modern construction and require different understanding and skill and solution. Next, next slide, please. Okay, um, so generally speaking, uh, we could say a modern building tend to be, tend to be more uh, standardized, uh, relying on uh, hair barrier, vapor control membranes, uh, low conductivity materials, many times modular and standardized, uh, which actually insulate the indoor microclimate from the outdoor in winter and uh, in summer. And this modern building also rely on systems to regulate temperature and uh, relative humidity levels so the house can be uh, cooled down and heat up uh, very quickly. Uh, ventilation can be natural but often is supported by mechanical ventilation especially because of our building regs or uh, even air conditioning. Um, Traditional building is another story. So they are constructed from different materials uh, and different uh, structural um, form. Uh, they heat up and cool down more slowly. And they also deal with uh, moisture in a different uh, way, uh, with groundwater, with rain, uh, all this water going through this uh, permeable fabric. Uh, heating is uh, provided by a localized source of energy and from solar gain uh, through the window. Ventilation is natural, but uh, in addition to the window ventilation, there is uh, also, um, uh, there are actually uh, many hair flow and draft, um, which uh, uh, actually um, go occur through the chimney or through the micro gaps uh, into the fabric, and they contribute to keep the building uh, dry. Next slide, please. Uh, so with this uh, general picture in mind, we are gonna uh, delve into these differences between modern and traditional, just opposing uh, building physics phenomena that uh, um, such as air tightness, leakage, breathability, and uh, vapor barrier, capillarity, and uh, downproof membrane, natural mechanical ventilation, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, next. OK. So um, air tightness, um, let's start with this, is a, a relative new concern in the history of architecture. The transition from the, let's say, hair leakage and hair tightness, hair tightness driven buildings uh, was slow. And to explain it, let's do a step back in the history to the one of the first type of architecture ever known, the cave. Uh, caves around the world were used by our ancestors as a 
one of the, the first form of uh, semi-sedentary residents. And the cave relied on two key uh, concepts. Let's call them the structure and the technology. So the structure was the ground all around, and the technology obviously man-made was the fireplace. But these elements were fundamental for the survival of uh, the people there. And the, the terrain, the, the, the soil, sorry, provide uh, protection from the uh, outdoor weather fluctuations, such as, for example, cold and cold waves or humidity peaks. And uh, in this very stable indoor environment, the fireplace provided uh, uh, an additional energy to cook and heat the place. Um, the fire was fed by plenty of wood they could find uh, around the forest. And uh, the cave indoor was fully ventilated, so isolated from the weather, but not sealed. Um, at some point, of course, our ancestors realized that this place was safe, but at the same time was not comfortable to live in. And in addition, they start to understand there was a kind of depletion of resources around around them because of uh, the wood they collected from for, and and the food from the from the forest and and so they start to move and by moving they began to develop increasingly advanced survival techniques uh, up to, to learn how to manage uh, the coexistence with the surrounding environment uh, next slide, please. So I like this sentence of Patrick Webb that say basically that with time, uh, humans have learned to create the cave wherever they desired. And in my opinion, the traditional vernacular architecture represents the culmination of the humans and architect ability to design uh, comfortable in their environments in harmony with the uh, domesticated, uh, this time, outdoor environment using local material and uh, uh, local manufacturers. Among all the advances uh, and in the evolution of architecture from an environmental point of view, the glazed window represents a milestone due to their ability to stop air and rain, to penetrate indoor, and still guaranteeing the houses uh, to light. Next. But this is just one part of the, the story, let's say, because some, when we look at the, these beautiful buildings uh, um, and we focus on the structure, for example, they can be far more problematic. In this uh, thermographic picture, you can observe uh, a quite uh, patchy uh, house portrait with thermal and hair leakage at the window, at chimneys, uh, and uh, at the along the, the plant installation. And uh, like uh, the cave here, uh, these buildings are crossed by multiple multiple hair paths, and uh, and for this reason. Uh, uh, they have become nowadays incompatible with the, the current 21st century well-being and health standard. In addition, they require a lot of energy to be run, and this is especially important to consider because they do not rely anymore in this uh, utopia of illimited energy resources like our uh, Hanchester. Next, next slide, please. And the heat transfer due to the hair leakage, uh, which is happening by convection, however, it can also happen by thermal bridging and so by conduction mainly. Thermal bridges, uh, which I, I know that you probably already know, but let's uh, remind to us, are those uh, localized area of the building have envelope where heat is transferred faster. So they are in practice kind of heat highways straight to the outdoor. And uh, due to this, the, tem the temperature of the interior surface near to the thermal bridge uh, is lower. 
if this spot become become also cold and not ventilated and is not ventilated as well, this could lead to the condensation and moisture problem. This risk of condensation was much lower in the past or even null because the the, the old houses were constantly crossed by hair streams and draft. So the condensation was, wasn't really a problem to worry about. And even if happening, it had, it had enough time to evaporate during the summer months. This picture I'm showing here is about a retrofit of a project of a two grade delisted property. I'm working, um, I've been working recently um, as part of our energy modeling analysis of this house. Thermal bridges have been classified, as you may see in this uh, slide, subsequently analyzed, and uh, and uh, I mean the. The, the finding of this analysis uh, have been used and integrated in the wall energy performance uh, of uh, the building uh, model. Next slide, please. Um, so um, when we look at the modern house, uh, this is quite the opposite. Uh, so to increase the indoor thermal comfort uh, and uh, lose uh, as little as, as uh, as little energy as possible, um, we have been introducing new insulation materials into the fabric and put an end to the hair leakage by sealing the indoor as much as possible. And in this way, we have essentially created the real condensation problem. So let's take the build up on the, the left hand side to see uh, what is happening and, and why. Uh, this is a roof build-up formed by a thick layer of um, insulation that is keeping the inside temperature at 20 degrees, when outside, in this case, is zero as well. So if the, the, the build-up is not sufficiently airtight, the, the moist indoor hair can penetrate into the construction and then into the insulation fibers and, con and condense on the, um, on the cold side of insulation. On the right uh, hand side of the slide, you may also observe a gla glazer diagram, which we use often to calculate the risk of intern, uh, interstitial condensation. The, the diagram is a, an excellent way to predict um, condensation. And basically, uh, it is based on observing these two trends, the trend of the saturation pressure curve and the trend of the partial pressure curve. If the two cro uh, curves are crossing each other, at some point in the build-up, like it is happening in this slide at some point, this means that uh, the interstitial condensation um, is going to happen. And consider that for one millimeter wide gap, uh, you can have up to 360 of water per day. So a uh, small gap can actually damage uh, the structure in a serious way um, if uh, we are in this like modern configuration. Next slide, please. So the, the need for hair tightness uh, come from this exigence to bring to zero the hair path and prevent this hair movement. Uh, to make a building uh, high tight, you need to uh, an unbroken and continuous barrier wrapping the envelope all around. And such continuity can be obtained by using hair tight material and sealing uh, them at the joints. In this way, the insulation fibers behind the hair tightness will be safe from hair movement and moisture penetration. Next slide, please. So in practice, achieving this continuity is not so easy and uh, represents uh, a design challenge. Uh, in, the, in this retrofit project uh, I'm displaying here, for example, my first consideration was setting the airtight uh, barrier, which is uh, red, um, at the ceiling level to avoid uh, uh, complicated ceiling at the 
joint between the roof slope and the horizontal uh, beams already present in the building because this was a retrofit. However, because uh, of the implementation of the MVHR in the loft, which also sound the best option in this case, we have preferred uh, um, uh, to include the loft into the thermal envelope, so move the insulation to the roof level, and this force has to move the hair tight barrier as well because they are recommended to be placed uh, nearby. So this change uh, led us to find uh, a new solution and some compromise as well, which now is a bit long to explain, uh, but essentially uh, to introduce the membrane without cutting the joist that, of course, for heritage reasons um, need to be um, kept um, uh, as they, they were. And... Uh, um, in terms of hair tagged materials that you could use, uh, in addition to membranes and hair tagged board and spray, there are also uh, materials that can be, uh, I imagine, could be interesting to you. Um, and these materials are hair tagged in spite of not being marketed, uh, marketed in this way. And these materials are wood and the uh, render, plaster, steel, glass, of course, uh, precast uh, and cast in situ concrete, uh, but really depending on their density and uh, also screed, but need, need also double check. Other useful uh, hair tiger materials, uh, which can be used uh, at the joints are compression tapes, sealant, glue, render and grommets. And of course, the non hair tight materials are uh, for sure the porous one, so bricks, blocks, and concrete uh, most of the time. Uh, next slide, please. So as you may have understood so far, the hair movement uh, uh, phenomenon are strictly mm, related to the condensation phenomenon and to the water vapor. And the vapor is uh, all around in our homes. Uh, due to the, present, the presence of water. Um, as you certainly know, water uh, can exist uh, on the earth in three typical conditions, which are solid, liquid, and gas. Example of uh, liquid state in the house uh, is the water from your laundry, uh, baths, showers, uh, house plant, uh, and the water uh, that you use for, for example, uh, uh, mopping the floor or dishwashing. And um, gas example, other water droplets in the hair that you breathe or the vapor from the cooking process, for example. The transition, of course, between one state and another is obtained by heating up or cooling down. So as we learn at school, but just to, you know, to, to give you again, the, the, let's say the, the full picture, the process of liquid, liquid water becoming uh, water buffer, like evaporation, is the process uh, that requires energy. The opposite process that on condensation uh, uh, release energy. And uh, um, if, uh, let's say, at domestic level, the condensation represents a problem, as we know, in the atmospheric science, uh, the same pro exactly the same process at the wider scale is far less uh, uh, worrying because uh, it allows clouds to form, which are, of course, fundamental for the water balance on the, on the Earth. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so um, traditional uh, um, materials in traditional houses, uh, like timber or lime mortar or plaster or porous stone bricks, uh, um, they are perm I mean, they are perm moisture permeable. Um, and for moisture, I um, of course mean the amount of water vapor in the hair. And um, they, uh, in the in a whole building, uh, the fabric is continuously taking up or release moisture in response to the change of humidity and in the surrounding, like you can see uh, in the left uh, hand side. And um, 
let's say that um, in this way, the moisture is absorbed and also is able to evaporate away naturally. This is what we call breathable fabric. And in a well, uh, in a retrofit or a well maintained building, uh, which is heated and ventilated properly, this daily and seasonal moisture fluctuation tend to balance out over the time without causing problem. In modern construction, so quite the opposite on the right hand side, uh, ventilated cavities are widely implemented to, to disconnect the outer leaf from the inner insulation layer and to keep water out. Um, similarly, a uh, vapor control layer or barrier are applied on the, most, uh, on the more internal side of the insulation uh, to prevent water vapor uh, moving from the inside and accumulating in the fabric. Next. So in, uh, in summary, uh, while the traditional buildings act as uh, buffers in regulating these air temperature and the humidity differences with regular exchanges happening between inside and outside, the modern hair tight buildings aim to be uh, to obtain a kind of full separation from the external climate. And so energy exchanges between the two are limited. Next slide, please. Um, so um, let's now look at the ground uh, with uh, the next uh, juxtaposition between damp uh, uh, proof membrane and capillarity device. So capillarity uh, motion is the process of a liquid flowing in a narrow space in opposition to gravity. This is a fascinating uh, phenomenon, um, which occurs because of the intermolecular forces between the liquid and um, the surrounding solid uh, surfaces. And uh, in this um, picture, you may observe the different, on the left hand side, the different stage of uh, capillarity water flowing up in an egg porous brick after uh, it was placed on a, on a tray of water. And uh, it's interesting to observe that the, the brick will absorb the liquid at, um, um, uh, at a rate which decreases over the time. So it's very fast beginning and then slow at the end. In the way um, the capillarity water rise above the ground uh, water table up to the foundation of our home is very complex and um, uh, I will say that for us, what is important to know is um, understanding that this water can wick up from the damp soil and rise through the brickwork by capillarity, causing sometimes uh, damage to the also to the brickwork itself. Next slide, please. So in old buildings, um, um, I mean, in, the, in their original situation, like for example, with stone floor or directly laid on, on ground, um, this kind of structure allow moisture below the floor to rise and then evaporate without causing no detriment. Uh, if, uh, as often happen in a bad uh, retrofit, a concrete uh, insulate floor uh, with a damp proof membrane is installed, the floor immediately become waterproof. In this situation, the moisture, uh, which is continued to rise, of course, is not able anymore to, to penetrate the floor. And uh, um, because of this, the water can, is, uh, is likely to be pushed to the, to the wall, uh, where it could appear as a um, a damp uh, spot. So to contrast with this uh, issue, uh, we have been using at Adam for a long time, lime crate floors, uh, which allow moisture to escape uh, naturally. And uh, they are also great from an embodied carbon point uh, of view because they are produ produced using uh, less energy can, and they can be recycled as well at the end of their um, uh, life. Um, the build-up is formed by a lime screed and two 
textile membrane, and then in the middle, the geo cell foam glass aggregate. Underfloor heating can also be incorporated. Next slide, please. Uh, in the modern building, of course, the use of a damp proof membrane is still considered a good uh, practice, especially for those buildings that are aiming to achieve passive house standard or in general high comfort standard. The membrane is often used underneath uh, the concrete uh, floor or below the insulation if present uh, to prevent the damp and the moisture uh, for, from entering the building. Um, the, the precise position of the membrane will change the type of membrane that we use, we, uh, you will choose. And uh, it's important uh, the membrane is continuous with the damp proof course around the wall and the structure. Um, okay, now on the right hand side, uh, this is the last note about this uh, new system that we are uh, we just came across recently for a retrofit project at Adam. Uh, the name is High Q Term and uh, is a uh, an holy one uh, system which can be used in a retrofit process uh, in project. Sorry, um, and uh, it rely on active capillarity. Uh, which allow to transport uh, moisture from the inside and uh, the outside and regulate this uh, evaporation process. And the capillarity, uh, which is provided by the insulation itself, is um, happening because these the small holes in the insulation fabric are filled uh, with calcium silicate material, uh, which is a material which guarantees um, basically an, uh, a good uh, permeability and uh, capillarity. So the same product is able basically to guarantee a high thermal capacity to insulate, but um, also um, uh, permeability. The system has been developed by Rammers, if you are interested, of course, the Let's say the uh, the negative aspect is uh, is um, is cost because it require uh, to be coupled with uh, um, a specific mortar and render. So the whole package is a bit expensive. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, thermal mass is also another important uh, building physics. Uh, process, all buildings previous to the arrival of the insulation only relied on thermal mass. And thermal mass basically is the ability of the material to store heat uh, from the surrounding and uh, basically absorbing heat and releasing at night in summer and, uh, and uh, in winter storing heat and uh, releasing in the indoor um, at night when actually, which is actually the coldest uh, um, period of the day during winter. The, 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 um, in terms of strategy, the difference between the two scenario is that in summer you use the ventilation to basically help these surfaces uh, to cool down and expel the heat. In winter, you will leave your window closed, of course, um, to keep the, the heat in. Uh, next slide, please. So generally speaking, uh, um, the denser is material, the better uh, is the thermal capacity, so the thermal mass. Um, heavy construction material like concrete, brick, stone, they have a very good thermal mass. And in this chart, you can observe the comparison between temperature fluctuation in two types of build-up. So one is block work, so high thermal mass, and the other is timber wall, so low thermal mass. And as you may see, the block work is really good, has really good behavior in responding slowly to the change in temperature, of uh, the changes of the temperature outside, and is able to keep uh, his internal, um, the internal temperature uh, very stable. Uh, in contradiction, the timber is doing the opposite, is actually following uh, the external fluctuation all the time. Next slide, please. 
Um, the insulation uh, in modern building uh, um, works uh, um, in a very different way. So instead of absorbing and releasing heat, like in the thermal mass, uh, the insulation is simply slowing the heat transfer. And uh, I mean, the manufacturing industry of insulation is progressing a lot now with increasingly efficient in solution. Solution. Uh, in this picture, I put, I, I thought, I found interesting is an active thermal insulation system, which actually used the ground as a seasonal uh, heat accumulator of uh, large capacity and used this energy um, in winter through a heat exchanger to heat to distribute the heat in the wall, external uh, wall of the houses. Next. And the uh, wind, of course, need to provide a certain resistance to the heat transfer. In the UK historic uh, buildings, uh, the use of uh, such windows is currently, is currently being uh, compromised by the current uh, uh, changes in building regulation uh, in terms of U-value and air tightness. So we are uh, currently performing a research uh, study at HADM in order to look at a possible improvement of the SASH components in collaboration with the manufacturer, of course. Um, and, uh, and we are uh, studying a set of um, solution, uh, like for example, the integration of double glaze, triple glaze, and even uh, uh, vacuum technology. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is uh, one of the last building physics phenomena we are gonna see. So old building and new building uh, um, adopt again, different form of ventilation. All buildings uh, have been always governed by three types of ventilation only, single side ventilation, cross ventilation and stack effect. Uh, such ventilation, I mean, these ventilation types do not uh, happen in isolation, but they are often mixed together, especially in buildings with complex floor plan, double heights or connected spaces. And the driving force uh, feeding the first two um, uh, is uh, actually actually uh, number uh, one and three, I can see, yeah, is the wind pressure. Uh, why does the stack and chimney effect is mainly driven by thermal buoyancy effect, which occur when you have a density difference between uh, two masses of hair. Next slide, please. And um, of course, modern building uh, adopt, uh, in addition to natural ventilation or sometimes replacing totally them, uh, mechanical uh, vent. This is an example uh, from uh, a um, retrofit project as well. So this technology can be integrated in uh, whole buildings. This was a, a, a listed property. So we invest much effort in uh, designing uh, the network of supply and extract ductwork into the, um, into the ceiling void um, in order to do not interfere uh, too much with the existing um, heritage of the building. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, uh, this is uh, the last uh, uh, pair of phenomenon. So, fireplace and heating system. Um, the fireplace uh, is a very localized source of energy which transmits heat by radiation. And the real issue of this fascinating source is the low efficiency, because uh, the higher is the distance from the fireplace and the lower will be the intensity of this radiation. In addition, there are 70-80% of heat going away through the chimney. Uh, so in case in your retrofit project, the semen is retained as part of the retrofit uh, intervention, uh, you could use uh, um, paneling or screens. Uh, these are highly suggested, especially when the, chimney, the fireplace is, um, is working to improve the comfort and provide also protection from the draft. Next slide, please. And um, so the great uh, advantage of the modern heating system, of course, is the capacity to spread uh, the heat across the building uh, in a uniform way. 
Uh, something maybe of your interest is a term of fireplace, which actually convert a classical fireplace in a heating and hot water system. Uh, the distribution of the heat in the rooms occur through a system of pipes fed by air or water, and uh, the high temperature is achieved. Um, um, I mean, the, the temperature to, to heat the fluid in the pipes is obtained by uh, the fireplace itself, and the glass is applied in front of the fireplace to avoid heat losses uh, through the main uh, room where the, the fireplace is uh, located. Uh, next slide, please. So um, at this point, uh, um, there was a couple of other slides uh, on um, to wrap up everything, but we are very close to the the end of the presentation. Uh, so I will suggest maybe if we see if there are questions, and then we will use the last uh, part just to maybe go through the last takeaway messages. What do you think, Georgia, Mark? I think oh. you can continue with the presentation. Okay. Yes, Martina, I think I, I have so many questions. My problem is ask, is reducing them to which ones. <laughs> so I've, I've put some in there, but I think that will be the same probably for um, many others. And, you know, they're such interesting subjects. And also I would say that because you you are, have, um, you, which is very good, you, you are, explaining general principles, then always one's mind goes to the particulars and the specifics and you think, well, what if, you know, and so on. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I think it, it may be useful uh, even to take, uh, when you finish, I, I would say carry on and finish, but you might want to, or Georgia in the meantime, if we get other questions, if people want to put them in chats, maybe could group them so that, because we probably uh won't have time to deal with all the questions <laughs> that we could have um except if you were going to come back and do another lecture <laughs> so, <laughs> so um okay i i would uh would you say georgia just for, for oh, i was saying martina to continue to yes yes do continue martina and then we'll okay we'll, yes um, come back later that's okay that's fine uh so um yeah, this is really about to wrap up everything. So we have seen many building physics processing. And uh, let's say uh, that uh, when it comes to retrofit, uh, what we really suggest is adopting a wall building approach with considering the building in its context and uh, find, let's say, balanced uh, solution to save her uh, heritage, but also um, improve the energy performance of the building. These include uh, the application of passive strategies and active strategies. Passive strategies are those ones related to the principles that I've explained. Next slide. The active strategies are, of course, that one that imply a production or the use of the energy. Let's skip. Go on. And the integration of um, energy performance modeling into the design can be of great help to bring the energy demand predicted uh, to the desired level and inform the design process uh, from, I mean, since very early stage. Uh, next slide, please. And this is not uh, uh, just about like uh, collecting data, inputting it in a software and run the software. No, this is really about an iterative process uh, where uh, you carry on with the design and then you test your design uh, in by simulation and then uh, you think about option and you test again until you achieve um, the, the performance that you are aiming for. Next, please. This is a screenshot from uh, a, an analysis that we have done recently. Um, the purpose of this project was uh, trying to improve in this retrofit uh, the energy performance, and uh, we achieved this uh, by again applying uh, uh, PHPP um, modeling uh, for passive house building, and we managed to halve actually the, the energy demand, as you may see here. 
Next slide, please. Uh, a, a challenge is always integrate then this change into the design. Here uh, you can see the integration of uh, a um, uh, actually a grill for ventilation uh, purpose uh, into uh, a traditional cornice profile. So um, I mean there is there is always a lot of effort uh, also on the design side, of course, to make this uh, alteration um, possible and aesthetically acceptable. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, uh, um, calculating the payback period is also a very good strategy to engage the client and uh, um, basically uh, make him understand about what is the capital cost, what are the saving every year. In this case, you can see a comparison between insulation in the external wall, um, MVHR and the hair tightness. And then of course, they pay back that they will uh, obtain. Next slide, please. So this is the end of the presentation. Um, just a few words to summarize. So I will stress one more time the importance of the climate crisis and uh, the change of mindset uh, that we are all asked to do. Uh, the existing UK building stock uh, represents a big challenge. Retrofitting this property means upgrading them from an aesthetic point of view, but especially in energy performance point of view. Then every building is unique, but in the first hint instance, it's important to have in mind the main differences between old and modern properties. And um, uh, integrating technologies is also um, uh, possible, but sometimes you can this can lead to unwanted consequences. And in general, the use of uh, uh, environmental modeling in support of uh, design, which uh, is uh, an absolutely um, step forward to do. And this is really the hand. Thank you. <laughs> Next uh, slide, because I think there are the resources I've used. And then next, it's just my thank you to you. Well, thank you, um, Martina. That was, that was um, amazing. Great overview. So, but I think Georgia, Georgia, you should be fielding the... Um, yes, the I'm reading them now. But first, uh, you have a lot of questions. Let's start with them. Yeah, and um, I mean, in general, I am available by email also. So if you if you want to forward to me the the, the question that we have no time, uh, I'm very happy to do that. Yes, let's start with Mark questions. He so, had a lot of questions. I have I have a lot. Uh, so I think Martina, you want to choose which of one which of the ones you feel um, are more relevant. Um, I mean, my first question was really whether you're also developing strategies for new buildings, new traditional classical buildings, you know, completely new, but um, fresh designs. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, but that's maybe different to the since that would take us in another direction. Um, then I have one comment about the old versus modern. Uh, we had a lot of slides with the comparison of old versus modern, and I, I was a little bit worried that if showed to you know members of the public or you know professionals or politicians or they could give the impression oh old is always dreadful um, and modern is always good, and uh, I well, first of all so I think it's a that that's uh, just a kind of anxiety about that because in some cases this is correct but it's not always. Um, you know, they're, they're just coming, having come back from Sweden and Norway. There's some old, you know, 19th century buildings there that perform terribly well. Um, and then the other thing is that mid 20th century buildings, in my experience, which may be just anecdotal, seem to be almost the worst. You know, the, they're, they're neither one nor the other, and they they really can perform dreadfully in terms of you know condensation, mold, and all of that. So that that was. Uh, another thing and then with the um i think that those are more maybe you know general discussion points that you may not want to get into but i think on on the level of detail there'll be probably several of us in the room who are interested in um you know how you retrofit 
when it gets to the practicalities, particularly if it's um, historic building or listed above all, if it's listed. And the um, the you know the solution of external wrapping your insulation around the outside of a masonry building seems such a, let's say an obvious strategy because it has so many plus points and so on. But then, you know, if you draw it as a typical section, like you, one of your sections, it all looks really good. But then you suddenly think, ah, but what happens at the windows? And then, you know, all the doors. And then, at least in my experience, which is probably amateur, um, you know, things seem to fall apart in the sense of, well, what do you do at the windowsill? I mean, how do you... Um, if you're thickening up the wall, but you have a listed building with, say, existing... You will not do that. If yeah, it's exactly. Building. First yeah. of all, you don't change the proportions and the exterior of a listed building, so your question is not really... Well, <laughs> but I'm just saying you guess. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but, um, maybe not with a listed, but still with a building that is uh, maybe not listed. Maybe. But it's, it's, it's these, these are the kind of problems that when you go from the... Um, general diagrams to actually implementing a specific solution. So anyway, that's that. There are okay. three questions that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I will try to like respond briefly, and the way, then we can also expand maybe later. But so in general, in terms of uh, new build, yes, we are also investing a lot uh, on new build. Um, <clears throat> this is because, well, first of all, because we have many clients. Uh, uh, requesting this but uh, in terms of new build there are many challenges as well one of these uh, is uh, part o so the new regulation uh, which actually is trying to prevent from uh, overeating risk and uh, according to part o regulation you have to verify your building against overeating risk following uh, two methods the simplified method and the thermal dynamic method and when you test when you model the new building and you still want to implement all um, all the you know this floor plan with a uh, um, big uh, glazed facade the house the model is going to fail so you are not allowed anymore to decide how much glaze you want to put in the facade there are new restrictions so in terms of new build we are focusing on the moment in finding the right balance which on one side represent our style our kind of architecture but and at the same time uh, is compliant with the regulation and the sash window is key on this because the sash window is such a um, particular window where actually you can use just the half to ventilate. So when you are testing this uh, against uh, the model, uh, basically you have a lot of light uh, penetrating into the room, but just the half is useful for ventilation. So a casement is responding very better in terms of mitigating overeating risk. So at the moment we are researching on these two aspects, so uh, overeating and uh, also uh, the future uh, use of such window in our uh, architecture. Um, then the, um, the other uh, question about uh, the um, uh, what is good or uh, I mean like traditional is bad, new is good. Uh, so I really want to keep uh, um, the, the, my final message as a impartial because uh, my purpose was really understanding with you because I also studied, you know, me while preparing this, this slide. So basically the idea was trying to just understand this phenomenon. And then every time you approach a retrofit, uh, let's just remember that the building is unique. The building has a certain age and uh, this age is probably um, uh, telling us, I mean, is, is giving us a set of uh, ingredients uh, to work with. So like, for example, a specific build uh, wall type, uh, a specific floor type, a uh, specific uh, window to wall ratio, etc. So uh, I, I do agree that uh, there is not bad or uh, good. There are just uh, um, different uh, uh, building physics uh, phenomena going on. 
in traditional and modern. Uh, I think the problem is when you have an old building and you are trying to input new technology and this match doesn't work because you are not considering the nature and the importance of some building physics process, like, for example, permeability uh, of a wall, for example, of a fabric. Um, and then about the yeah the, the the last question about the put the the, um, the insulation side of course uh, yeah in general I don't have too much experience with this because we mainly apply indoor because of the uh, of the heritage reasons of the, the appearance of the building outside but in general when you are had the insulation side there there are a lot of the other consideration to take into account and the first one that uh, I think is about for example light daylight because of course you are uh, increasing the depth of the reveal and this has a lot of influence in the daylight in the daylight distribution into the room so less light this means that you need to use more artificial lighting this means that you are increasing carbon emission so on one side you are saving on the other side you are actually um, increasing the use of energy I hope I touched uh, yes, yeah. less no, or no, more uh, everything. Okay. Um, Jan has a very interesting question. If we can let him ask directly. Jan, are you still with us? Jan Maciak. So he's asking, your focus dwells on energy usage and loss. You have not said much about the long-term energy efficiency of longevity and ease of maintenance. High technology ages buildings prematurely, and we will not be better safe by upgrading the traditional techniques of breathability as simple as possible, no membranes and plastics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yes, this really, uh, this, um, I really appreciate the question. I mean, unfortunately, there is not, not time, of course, to, to see at all the consequences. In general, uh, um, for example, the use of plastic that is mentioned, and this is really about also the embodied carbon implication of this intervention, because my talk was trying to address especially operational energy side, but that's super true that there is a harder consideration to do in terms of what about the whole carbon life of this new product that we are using? In fact, uh, the classic contradiction is, for example, try to um, in, uh, increase the energy performance by increasing the insulation and uh, um, choosing an insulation that actually is petrochemical, for example. Because natural insulation, unfortunately, do not have the, the same uh, capacity uh, to actually um, uh, make resistance to the heat transfer. So in this situation, you have to choose between actually improving the operational energy or adopting a more natural insulation which unfortunately will have less uh, um, uh, insulation properties. So it's always a choice because uh, every time the budget uh, is limited uh, by the country. Also, the, um, uh, the size of the house is limited. You cannot uh, increase the thickness of the wall by one meter, of course, because otherwise there is no space to live anymore. So it's all, always trying to balance uh, the... Um, the intervention that you plan uh, in, the, in the best way. And for this reason, I was mentioning modeling because through the modeling exercise, you can uh, um, compare this option and then finally choose that one that is more environmental friendly. So absolutely, I do not agree that technology cannot be integrated. It can, and uh, it can improve the, the whole life uh, carbon of building and the uh, operational performance, but there are always choices to be done because uh, there are always consequences. So sometimes you really have to choose uh, because we don't have the, the, the perfection. We don't have the natural material that perform incredibly, that insulate incredibly and the match with the high 
thermal comfort standard uh, because uh, uh, the historic building uh, um, do not use all this energy because uh, uh, in the past, uh, we didn't uh, have like a 20 degree in the homes. So we accepted the very lower comfort standard. Uh, we have Chris Fagan with some interesting comments. If he's still with us to answer because he wants yeah, to talk yeah, about yeah. some to... natural insulation. And in general, I would also like to say that as a conservation architect, Mm -hmm. uh, there are other things to be protected. We cannot talk only about carbon, but there is also the heritage value of the buildings. And Absolutely. here's where the balance has to be found Absolutely. in a better way. So Chris, uh, Fagan, it, are you still with us? Yes, um, thank you. Sorry I'm on the road. But um, these questions that Mark, you brought up and some others um, are kind of exciting to me because I'm dealing with some of the same compromises, right? How do you preserve the historic integrity, but make it livable by today's standards? So I think for me, I can offer a few things I've learned and come across more from a perspective of the owner and community's interest, um, but also some of it about the use of natural, ethical materials, um, easily renewable materials. So the first is, um, so I've tried a few things, but uh, the... Association of Preservation Trades, or APT, is an American-based organization, and they have a committee that I've recently joined that is really focused on exactly this question. And actually, they draw a lot of resources from the UK's heritage programs, um, a lot of the science related to how to marry sustainability with historic preservation is coming out of the UK, um, which also is a a uh, humid, temperate climate, you know, which is really the biggest chat, one of the bigger challenges for passive design, but also where a lot of major population centers are concentrated. So I think it's important. Um, one thing that I've found is it's kind of like you try to weigh what the traditional building does well and try to mitigate, try to preserve that while mitigating its problems. So, you know, dampness, um, air leakage are usually some of the bigger ones in my region. Um, but I think that the vapor permeance of a lot of these structures is an important thing to preserve while increasing insulation. So I've found that using weather barriers and carefully designed flashing that still permits drying from both directions of the wall is important. Um, another material that I've found is expanded cork. It's still quite expensive, but I hope that it can become more easily available and more of an economy of scale. Um, essentially, it compares to rock wool in performance. It's very inert. It, it bugs don't go after it. It doesn't burn. Uh, it doesn't attract fire. It does not support mold. It doesn't change due to moisture, but it's very stable, very tough, and it's only made out of waste cork particles used together in a heat press. So you don't have to kill the tree to get it. The problem is it's still expensive because not enough people are making it. But it's so in a project of mine, we took a timber frame building. We kept all the interior lime plaster, which had a lot of good thermal and environmental qualities. And then we added as little thickness of external insulation as we felt we should, which is two inches because the cladding was well past its use. So we replaced the exterior cladding in kind, added about two inches of thickness with a vapor barrier, well, not a vapor barrier, a weather barrier that permitted drying through the wall, external insulation and a rain screen. And, um, you know, we felt that that was a good compromise in that case. But I would just say that what I've learned is stay away from foam, stay away from vapor barriers, try to allow the building still to breathe and dry out. Um, because otherwise you're going to invite bigger issues and I think that's it, but it, it's, um, it's an interesting challenge, but there's a lot of people starting to tackle it. And I don't think it can be the same for any two buildings. I think you have to consider at least each type uniquely. Thank you. Douglas, do you have an interesting question too? 
Can you, would you like to ask it directly? Uh, unmute, unmute. We can Thank see. you to Chris for the comments. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. We don't hear you, Douglas. I don't know why we don't hear Douglas. We, we can see you, but we cannot hear you. <laughs> okay. He can, Maybe he can write or? Can you try again, Douglas? No, he cannot. So it's a longer question. He said like this, most of the technical means of energy flow control you've described, and this is not unusual, are hidden within the fabric, like diffuser in interstices or the building or within interstices. They are not immediately obvious. One could argue that it is very more in the appearance and the aesthetic of some neo-traditional buildings. Is there a question of truth in the aesthetics of complex modern energy efficiency construction? As our Jeffrey Scott said, truth in architecture is a question of degree rather than principle. And if so, what are the limits of this degree? It's quite complicated. Can you answer this or we take another question? Hi. Look, yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Now we hear you. Yes. yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry, it's a complicated question. It wasn't meant to be. Um, I hope uh, it's, it's not too difficult. Really, it revolves around the, what buildings should look like. If you have uh, traditional ideas of traditionalism in buildings, but principally new traditional buildings, neo-traditional buildings, rather than conservation buildings, but the case may also be the same there. The question arises, what should new neo-traditional buildings look like if in fact they contain a great deal of technology? Should this technology be exhibited? Should it be concealed? And if so, what is the moral and ethical justification for one or other position or somewhere in between? Of course, there are plenty of examples of really good architecture, Alan Short and uh, Short and Ford's buildings, for example, um, where the technology of natural ventilation, passive solar design, and so on and so forth, are used in a very sensitive way with an architectural language and grammar. There are less sensitive examples that we can think of. The question arises, is this an issue for traditional buildings? Should technology be given its voice within the building? Or is it persona non grata? Should it be concealed away, not seen at all? Or is there a place in between? Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it makes sense. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting position. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure I have the answer about, you know, the, the, the future of this traditional building of the future. Um, yeah, I will say that uh, at the moment, uh, uh, meanwhile, we are uh, retrofitting traditional properties. Uh, we are actually building uh, the heritage of the future. And uh, actually, in spite, uh, I agree that uh, our focus is always try to minimize uh, and apply this uh, uh, new few technologies sometimes uh, because you don't need too much stuff many times in a sensitive way still you will have an impact of uh, the aesthetic. So, for example, I was uh, um, discussing uh, yesterday with the manufacturer uh, the appearance of uh, a vacuum glazing uh, to apply on a sash window. And, you know, the vacuum technology actually has this uh, little dot that you can see on the surface of the glass. And these make uh, basically this window not really acceptable for a listed properties. But the good news is that the technology is uh, advancing and they are studying uh, to have this uh, transparent uh, dot 
which will be basically invisible. So this is an example uh, about uh, actually the technology is advancing, but uh, we cannot wait for the perfect uh, invisible technology. Again, we need, I think, a bit of compromise uh, because, for example, when sometimes I see whole buildings uh, with uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, integrate, for example, I don't think personally that is is wrong. This can be done in a very sensitive way, again, because we have uh, tiles that can be, uh, you know, um, integrated in the, into the existing building and uh, sometimes they are quite uh, invisible to recognize and to differentiate compared to the to the to the normal tiles uh, but yeah in general when i see this intervention i think uh, that's fantastic. It's a traditional building. It's still alive. People live in there in a in a comfort way, in a comfortable way, and uh, and uh, we are not demolishing this building. <laughs> Um, am I allowed to um, add to that, Martin? I don't know because well, I think I think um, uh, Douglas, if I got it right, was also asking for a sort of philosophical um, position mm -hmm. on this, as opposed to anything specific. And it it just mm -hmm. occurred to me, and I'm I'm only uh, improvising, and I've never thought about it before. But I wonder it would be nice to have um, Martina's view. It it strikes me. I mean, I often use the analogy for other things of a a dog and a tail. You know, it's when you have an appropriate uh, use of a tail. You know, the dog is wagging the tail. When it's inappropriate, that if we there is this concept of, you know, it's impossible, of course, the tail that wags the dog. So I think with um, the changing technology um, and new inventions, discoveries, and so on that have affected architectural form before, let's say, the modern period or before the Second World War, you would uh, the building form would change, but in a kind of relatively subtle way. So, for example, the panes of glass. You know, once once you have that technology of glass, you can watch glass affect the design of windows over time. But it doesn't completely transform the whole building. You know, you get shifts, and so you know you get you get panes of Georgian. Well, obviously you had smaller panes before, little circular ones. Then you you know the lead lights. Then you move to Georgian panes. Then you move to the sort of Victorian, um, you know, larger panes of, of glass and so on. And but it uh, somehow still remains um, subservient to the. Uh, in other words, they're like tails to a dog. The dog is still able to go forward. When you get to say the Pompidou Centre, which would be an emblematic building in which the architect has didactically and declaratively sort of announced to the world that the aesthetic of the building is driven by technology, that is a different thing. And, and a traditional approach would never um, sort of countenance that kind of uh, reversal. That's just, I don't know if Douglas, that that helps. I, 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 I understand what you're saying. I agree with it to a certain extent. I think that one can look to Victorian industrial architecture in particular and see technology that it does uh, meld itself very obviously with um, uh, classical and gothic forms in one form or another in really quite bizarre ways. So these kind of chimera, these sort of hybrids, um, are just a normal fact of architectural life, I think, in one form or another. It's where on the sort of spectrum ex of extremity to normality you actually place good architecture. Um, this, is, this is what I'm sort of looking for uh, in, in sort of questioning people about this, is where does the balance lie? Um, it's because we, we can see all sorts of a wide range of different approaches to the, the question of truth in traditional architecture, but also in other forms of modern architecture too. Um, often it's uh, highly, highly modified and uh, stretched to the limits. But I take your point that the tail should not wag the dog, that actually there are standards, uh, there are sort of a, a median point and Palladio and Colin Campbell maybe had it right, but actually there are formula which um, do hit the nail on the head for most conditions most of the time. The idea of a pattern book, for example, where you've just got everyday good designs that work, even a modest builder can build them. Um, they work because they're just in the middle of the road, they're good. Um, and it's where you get off that kind of middle of the road that you start getting to these extreme designs where you start having problems in terms of conceal or reveal or technology that's trying to be too, too ambitious or too under-ambitious sometimes. 
We have a short questions from Radoslav. Can you unmute your microphone and ask about um, some layers of the flooring? He's asking what type of flooring goes directly on the lime creek? Are there additional separation layers? Yes, uh, I wanted to know if uh, wooden flooring uh, is possible on this type of floor and if there are any maybe uh, moisture issues that uh, would maybe uh, have influence on the on the wooden flooring. Uh, so my experience uh, uh, with these uh, lime crate uh, floors uh, is actually we apply back the original uh, pavement that was present in the house because exactly this was uh, permeable. So all the point is uh, actually keeping uh, um, the original material at uh, having below a, a system which is uh, protecting some way uh, the floor, but also guaranteeing this uh, air and water transfer through. So um, basically um, permeable materials uh, and in general the, the, the material that are already present uh, unless you have uh, like a concrete floor are great for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thomas, would you like to ask your question directly? about traditional materials or components for retrofitting? Yeah, so it's just a, an observation that a lot of the uh, materials and components um, that uh, are available for retrofitting. So I've, I've given the, the example of, maybe I should have used the term um, double glazed windows. Uh, and the, the example was also given of solar panels. So I've uh, been um, in, in a lot of um, discussions at um, planning committees where the owner of a listed property is saying um uh i've got single glazed windows i really want to put double glazed windows on but that's going to change the appearance of the buildings because the people who make the windows always seem to start with a modernist aesthetic and then we've had sort of discussions with various um councils on the committee saying oh um the energy crisis uh, in terms of uh, climate change is so uh, extreme that we need to accept that we have to change the appearance of these buildings in order to save energy. Um, but of course, there are um, example, historical examples, say, of uh, double glazed win windows. So, for example, in Sweden, from about 1800 onwards, they had a traditional system of double glazing using casement windows the outside layer opens outwards and the inside layer opens inwards. And they look perfectly good as traditional um, elements because they were designed at that time. But of course, people stopped in, in, in a lot of ways designing traditional things, maybe you know, in, in say 1950. And there are a lot of problems where modernists have come up with a solution and something in their aesthetic, which is being used all over the place. But our traditionalists also coming up with those same solutions and same components so that we don't actually have to ruin the appearance of traditional buildings by putting modern components on them. I really appreciate the observation. I think this really, you know, uh, link with the previous uh, discussion raised by Douglas and Mark, you know, about uh, the fact uh, these changes are happening uh, so fast that the, the market uh, um, and the industry is not ready to provide solutions that are acceptable uh, for us. And uh, you do know the comparison uh, with the, the North countries that uh, actually are thinking about uh, energy efficiency uh, far before than us. Um, the point is, uh, uh, I think things are changing, even if not so rapid, but um, 
there are many manufacturers that are now, uh, you know, like operating uh, their portfolio or product, uh, uh, including like uh, mm, uh, new ways to incorporate uh, basically energy efficiency principle into traditional design. I think uh, in general, windows are making good progress. Uh, this is my, my, my view, at least, uh, especially in this uh, sash window. Um, uh, uh, market that I'm exploring at the moment. So manufacturers are really trying to make these new advances and make them invisible in the way that they cannot appear as a kind of like big change in the appearance of the element. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, my point is, again, we need to use what we have at the moment. The regulations are already present, uh, especially for new build. So the new homes that we are building need to comply with these. And in general, for all traditional and especially listed buildings, there are uh, um, more flexible uh, uh, targets. For example, if you uh, go for a Hennerfit, uh, Passive House Standard or ACB Standard, you have a kind of relaxation of uh, the, the the target that you have to comply. So um, also uh, the government and the standards understand that uh, for traditional building is a bit more difficult. So uh, we do not need to comply with the the the, the more uh, uh, like strict the target uh, as a new build. Uh, but yeah, in general. Uh, I don't have a precise answer. I think that uh, is always a kind of choice and balancing uh, um, new small intervention uh, uh, with the keeping the general appearance. I come from Italy, uh, from a country with a lot of history, and it is so sad to see our building uh, being empty because actually in Italy, the approach is basically you do... Uh, as less as possible, you don't touch because you have to retain uh, the original building. And so these buildings are basically sometimes happy and they are absolutely obsolete. You cannot live in there. So I will say that a middle ground um, will be the maybe the the, the good uh, <laughs> the path to the future. I don't know if someone else wants to add something to this. I don't see any other new questions. I would also like to ask my own question, which is about um, air tightness. Okay. If having a building airtight as you aim to, it's not changing the way in which the historic materials are behaving because they are not meant to not permit the circulation of the air and they will degrade in a much faster rate. So practically for having a better environment, you are sacrificing the building after all. I mean, historic building listed with a value, with heritage value, those shouldn't be treated like mm -hmm. a bad well... building. No, that's a very interesting point, the, the degradation one that you're raising. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the hair tightness, uh, uh, we have we had a project with this uh, um, of a tool, uh, to great listed building. Mm -hmm. And um, the intention was uh, um, extending this building and adapting to the modern uh, uh, lifestyle of a young couple. And uh, they really want to be very like uh, energy efficient. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, if you do not, if you do not invest in air tightness, it's very difficult to achieve the energy level that they were uh, asking for. So, or you accept uh, an higher uh, energy balance, energy demand, uh, or uh, if you want to go uh, for more ambitious targets. Uh, the higher tightness is a very valid strategy. Then the degradation point, uh, I mean, um, the higher tightness is all about dividing like the indoor and the, the exterior. So if you actually are able to keeping the exterior as permeable to vapor and air, should not be a problem, or at least a degradation should not happen. 
but uh, this is a good point and maybe it requires more study. Yes, uh, in conservation, we have the answers, of course. We wouldn't do something like that. Uh, the building has to breathe. And if you have a tight interior and you don't offer other means of ventilation, you will have growth of fungus, mold, and all sorts of. So interior and exteriors in general are working together. When uh, you apply an air tightness strategy, this needs to be coupled with uh, a mechanical ventilation. This means that the mold grow cannot happen because in spite of the, the building is sealed, you keep uh, the building ventilated indoor. So actually this phenomenon that you are describing is not happening. If you of course, if you just put the air tightness and then uh, you forget to open window, it's gonna be, I don't know, a forest <laughs> there. So absolutely is not uh, suggested. But when you couple this with the ventilation strategy, the risk of having the indoor deteriorated, there is no risk on this. I can guarantee you because uh, there is a machine that is going, is doing yeah. everything for you. But this is like uh, life assisted buildings. So it's like uh, now we have a dead building let's put it under artificial breathing and all those very harsh somehow measure instead of helping to behave in a better way but using uh passive means of environmental management okay yeah learning from the past rather than inventing uh future which we don't really know how it will behave in the future yeah i think this is um sorry to this is um come through in quite a few of, of the comments i mean i think um um there was so uh, yeah it was jan's point wasn't yes. there some time back i, I trust i think I tried it, to ask jan. i mean i'm i'm just getting worried about um uh martina's uh, time availability i mean the sense that this is, I'm sure, one of these debates that will that will become more sophisticated over time, and it will probably need. I mean, it, it'll probably need a you know a gap of time because the new regulations and so on are coming at us so quickly, and the responses of all this, you know, the, the passive house movement has been developing uh, separately to anything to do with old buildings for a long time, and suddenly retrofit has become. You know, even the RIBA, you know, every other sentence is now is now a retrofit. So there'll be an awful lot done over the next few years. And it it probably won't only, only be in, you know, 10 years time. We'll actually be able to look back at all these um, problems. But we're certainly um, I mean, it's it's uh, all the comments are very thoughtful. And it's obvious that people are really um, concerned about these issues. So it, it's great to have a, a session on this. I mean, that's my feeling. I don't. I, I really didn't expect us to have all the answers. Um, you know, I, don't, I wasn't expecting that Martina would just, um, you know, give a presentation and then we all just go, ah, oh, right, that's it. Um, I, I think different people have said, you know, every building is different. I think it was it, Chris, uh, saying that point, and probably Martina herself. So I mean, it's a lot of food for thought, um, and and maybe um, people. Uh, if we are going to try and keep, um, say, the Robin Pender was quite a while ago already now, I, it would be great to have, um, let's say, um, th this kind of theme of sustainability, energy and so on and um, more frequently. So if people have ideas, um, do feed them to Georgia and myself. And um, um, Martina, that includes you. You know, if you think of other speakers or you could think of a way that we could maybe... Um, uh, get into more specific issues, perhaps um, having dealt with some of the uh, general problems, whether you would like to do another one or whether we get, you know, point us towards someone else. But I, I think it would be really good to continue this in, in tag talks. I don't know what if other people, do other people sort of feel the same way? Or Very much so, yes. Of yes, course. I think so, Mark. Yes, absolutely. Me, yes. I think it's a very good idea. I think it would... Uh, Garner a good audience and uh, it would be useful.
And I read some papers of Marie Martina, and I was um, very happy to find out that they have also studies on urban design. So how to design a new or even bigger city, which somehow fits with the historical properties, how to shape it to function better in historical ways. So if you would like to have another presentation of your studies on um, yeah, you build yeah, of course. Your, your neighborhoods, how to make them better, because there is another comparison in between uh, traditional and modern on a bigger scale. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when uh, you look at the at a wider scale, uh, there are uh, other, uh, of course, uh, not building, but urban physics <laughs> phenomenon yeah. that yes. are happening and are uh, actually, uh, of course, uh, affecting uh, uh, this time, not just uh, the uh, indoor thermal comfort, but also the pedestrian thermal comfort. So your experience uh, uh, of the of the street and uh, of the outdoor spaces. So more complexity, but uh, is a very fascinating uh, um, topic as well. Uh, this is really uh, a lot about my PhD. And then uh, at Adam, we have the Adam Urbanism Department. So of course, I'm applying now these uh, on, uh, on project. So it's very exciting. Yes, that would be very interesting for our audience. So we and can... uh, yeah, I mean, this uh, philosophical, let's say, question or not about what to do nowadays. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, I mean, it was uh, maybe another session. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy to participate, uh, even suggesting another speaker if you want. So yeah. Yes, that would be really interesting. So can we consider that all the questions have been answered? Jan, do you still want to ask something? I... No, I'm okay. I think it is a big topic. Um, and, I, I'm, and I think uh, Mark's uh, suggestion that we follow this up with okay. um, uh, with, with questions about balance, because it's, you know, everything's concentrated on CO2 emissions. And I think we're going to do ourselves a lot of damage by being so monofocused. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Balance uh, sounds the right uh, word for the next <laughs> presentation. I see. So thank you all for the present on this evening. We also have an interesting visit to a workshop on Tuesday. Next Tuesday, we are going to visit Vitrolytic workshop on 22 August. If you are interested, you can find a link on Eventbrite. And I would like to talk a bit about the next talk in September, 21 September. We will have a topic about new vernacular architecture, creating identity of place, research of practice, and the talk will be delivered by Jonathan Weathery. So we will jump a bit to a bigger scale, urban design, but still on the same um, topic of how to create spaces and uh, human scale development. So that would be Thank you all for the presence. Thank you. I hope to see you all in the next talk. Yes, thank, thank, you thank you very much. much. Martina, thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. you to all. Thank I you. enjoyed the time together. Have a nice night. Bye. You Good too. Thank you. thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.